You know, I uh, I turned on the um, the laptop today and <laughs> went to YouTube. Wow, um, I, I I I'm intimidated. I get intimidated by the number of people who are s subscribed to the channel that the Lord gave your servants. Uh, I really am. I get intimidated by that. I um, uh, thank you. I know a lot of enemies. Uh, people who don't like what um, is said are subscribed. I understand that, but uh, there are a lot of saints, and uh, like I said, more enemies and whatnot. But I mean, thank you, thank you. Um, I, I don't want to get lots of <laughs> subscribers, dude. I don't want that. I don't want that. I just keep it the way it is, okay? Nice and small, <laughs> okay? But I turned on the internet today, you know, the laptop, and the first thing I saw was this open-air preacher, that's the name of the channel, preaching sinless perfection. It's like, oh boy, it never ends, you know, between Catholics and antinomianists and uh, black Hebrew Israelites. Uh, apparently I've made a few of them angry lately. Anyway, good morning. It is... Uh, 10.55 a.m. the time that we're, I'm recording. So. Marriage. Marriage is what brings us together today. Marriage. If any of you know what that's from, I'm sorry. We've talked about marriage before in the past in um, several videos. By, like, pieces here and there... I think a majority, a majority of them are in videos where I wasn't putting the hashtag thing in the title. That's very helpful, you know. You know, you get some guys out there who get like thousands of videos. How in the wide world of sports entertainment are you supposed to re recollect? You know, you know, getting emails, you need to know this. Getting emails, it's like, oh, I, Lord gave me a video on that. Which one? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. It's only more recent where, like I said, you need to know this. Uh, it's only more recently what the hashtag thing. Uh, that way you can find them. You know, in the search on the YouTube here and the channel, you, you put in a word and like, for example, you put free grace and, and blah, 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 there they go. You know, I've since been doing the hashtags. But the, we have talked about marriage before in the past. Uh, this one's going to be a little bit more refined, and this is what this whole video is about. Okay? Uh, we got a lot of scripture today. Of course. That's what we do. That's what it's about. Not me, but thee, O oh Lord. And his perfect, inerrant, given by inspiration, word of God, the authorized version of the scriptures. Go get it. If you have a Bible, don't use that. If you have the scriptures, the authorized version, go get that. Read along with me. You know why? I make mistakes. <laughs> I'm not sinlessly perfect. Even antinomianists can readily refute that, that sinless perfection nonsense. I can't get off on that. that just, eh. Anyway, I make mistakes. You need to see what is being read to you. You need faith cometh by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Okay, I understand that there are some of you out there that are physically incapable that do my best. But if you're capable, get the scriptures. Read with me. Okay? Keep an eye on me. Like I say, I make mistakes. Sometimes the mouth goes quicker than the brain, okay? Be a Berean. Search the scriptures daily, whether these things be so. And brother, don't you neglect that. Don't you neglect this book. That's what Satan wants you to do. Okay? You be, your eyes are being opened. Don't neglect the book. Don't do that. Don't do that, brother. Now, when it comes to this thing of marriage, number one, show me in the scripture. Show me. Seriously, put it in the uh, in the comment section. Show me a ceremony. 
like what is usually present today. Show that to me in Scripture. John 2, huh? Okay? John 2, huh? All right. Uh, and also, i got to give a shout-out to the beloved uh, Brother Alexander B. Hartley. He, uh, he, he helps more than he actually thinks he does. Bless his heart and soul, and not in the southern way. Okay, but he, he, had, uh, he had something to do with this. But what do you do, okay, a ceremony. You know, like standing before a, Jes a Jesuit priest or standing before a judge or whatever. Show that to me in Scripture. Show it to me. John 2, huh? Here's your only shot. Verses 1 and 2. And the third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee. And the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And then it talks about the feast and the wine. Okay? Scripturally, there's wedding feast. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not refuting that. Uh, but as far as the ceremony, you know, standing before a judge, standing before a Jesuit priest, okay? And 12 years ago, when I was wed, we got the piece of paper. Uh, we went through the state. If I knew then what I know now about, because I didn't know. I didn't know. Even my wife was like, you know, we, we should burn that thing. You know, was, yeah, we can't find it <laughs> conveniently, which is funny. But it's like, no. No, about standing before someone. Now, is that wrong? Is that wrong, you know, to have a witness onto a marriage? No, 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 that's not wrong. But see, is its foundation of the ceremony of a preacher or a judge or a Jesuit or whatever, where is that in Scripture? Where is that in Scripture? Well, what's the other one you're saying? Huh? Oh, Revelation 19, right? Revelation 19. So John 2, no, that doesn't prove anything of a ceremony. You can assume, you might say, but uh, what's the first three letters? Okay. And as a beloved brother, a military man, once said to me, that assumption is the mother of all mistakes. Okay. We can assume many things, can't we? See, that this for the saint, not a Christian, saint, there's a difference. There's a big difference. This is the standard. This is the standard. So in Revelation 19, right? Okay, verses 7 on verse 9. <laughs> Number one. Number one. Okay, context tells us that this is a totally different thing than the marriage of a man and woman on earth. Totally different, okay? This is the marriage supper of the Lamb, okay? In reference to the body of Christ and also those His saints, okay? It's, it's different, okay? I mean, we'll, we're going to look at Ephesians 5 today where that example is given, but this is different. But let's, let's go along with what you're saying, all right? Okay, Revelation 19, 7 and 9, on the 9. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come. This, I think, too, is why certain people will refute or try to refute that the book of Revelation isn't chronological because of this. That doesn't make sense to me. They're trying, they got their own agenda, but we won't go off on that. Okay? Trying to defend the teaching of a man. And his wife hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen is the righteousness of the saints and he saith unto me right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb and he saith unto me these are the true saints of god now what do we get away from this a marriage supper okay obviously there isn't such a thing you know you get married you feast you eat yeah <laughs> Right? Okay? Or, or at least go out for Chinese food or something, right? Okay? Also, you have here the scriptural evidence where those, in some cases, 
arrayed in clean and white, uh, fine linen, clean and white. The bride adorned in white. Okay, so we can, you can, you can, you can go, it's like, okay, uh, you're going to be a bride, I'm going to wear white. Show me that in scripture. Okay, okay, all right, sure, fine, absolutely. Ceremony, though. Ceremony. You might be, and the thing about the, the ring, you notice I don't wear one anymore. The ring. Here's your homework assignment. Go on King James Bible Online and be careful because one of the references they pull up, uh, they put bring. They they highlight the word ring, but it's actually the word bring. You got to watch out for King James Bible Online. They do that stupid thing. and It's very irritating, very vexing. But look up ring in the scriptures or get a concordance even better. Okay? You'll notice that the singular ring, not one time in the authorized version, has anything to do with a man putting a ring on a woman's finger. What his context is, what it talks about is Pharaoh taking his ring off of his hand and putting it onto Joseph's hand. And also you see that in the book of Esther. But not one time in scripture do you see the word ring associated with a man putting on a ring on a woman's finger. You don't see that anywhere in script. Find it for me. Find it for me. I, I, I kind of looked, okay? All right, find it for me. It's not there. It's not there. Is that wrong in and of itself? I don't believe so. Because, as we discussed last night, you know, uh, some women, <laughs> some... When they see a ring on a man's finger, they're like, oh, he's taken. Men, you see a, a ring on a woman's finger, it's like, ah, she's taken. Right? But also, too, and this is another thing. For some, a ring is an attraction. As a lost man, I had an affair with a married woman. Okay? Actually, a few, but one that was significant. Okay? As a lost man. All right? And the ring on her finger was actually a draw for me. Okay? That happens. All right? But again, scripturally, you're not going to find anywhere, anywhere, a man put with singular ring, look it up yourself, of a man taking a ring and putting it on the woman's finger. You're not going to find that in scripture. Okay? Is that wrong? Is a ceremony to have... A, a ceremony wrong thing that do? No, I don't believe so. Is a ring a bad thing? No, I don't believe so. But where is it here? Where is it here? If I knew now what I knew then, oh, oh, things would have been so much different. <laughs> and now the big one. Here's the thousand dollar challenge for you, okay? Show me in Scripture. <laughs> and, and these guys get cute with this one. Show me in Scripture where we are to go to the states. Show me anywhere in Scripture. Scripture, not the Apocrypha. The Apocrypha is not Scripture. Thank you very little. Okay? Show me in Scripture where anyone is going to the state, to the government, to get permission to marry someone. Show it to me. You know what some of you cutie pies do? You know what some of you do? You go to First Peter 2, don't you? Oh yeah, you do. Well, I've encountered this. I've encountered this where these Christians, especially in the buildings, they say, you know, well, in order to be a preacher, you got to have the credentials, meaning a $1,000 piece of paper on your wall, meaning that you go to a Jesuit-run cemetery school and get a $100,000 piece of paper on your wall and you come out saying, Ye hath God said, and itching and tickling, uh, tickling people's ears. Okay, that's what they're talking to. You know where they go to? Where I, I have personally encountered for both. About where, Show me where it says that we got to go to the state to get married. You know what I've encountered? 1 Peter 2, 13 on to 17. Submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the Lord's sake, whether it be to the king as supreme or unto governors as unto them that are sent by him. There's the context right there too. 
sent by him for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of them that do well. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Okay? All right? That's what that is a reference on to. And see, they kind of, these Christians, like with the building, it's like you need to go to the Jesuits. They don't say that, but that's what you're going to, to get a $100,000 piece of paper on your wall. Say, you need the credentials. Show me that in Scripture. I've, I've encountered, they've come to here. It's like, dude, that's not what that's talking about. It's not what that's talking about. And we're going to see that it is actually contrary to our Lord Jesus Christ, God who is our Father. It is contrary in regards to marriage and especially in whom He calls to preach. It is contrary to God to go onto a state, onto a government to get permission. Okay? We're going to see it is contrary to that. Okay? Let's read. Continue. For so is the will of God that with well-doing ye may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men, as free, and not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servants of God. Honor all men, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the king. Okay? And also you could uh, reference Romans 13, verses 1 under verse 5. Okay? The punishment of evildoers. Okay? Thou shalt not kill crosses dispensational lines unless you're an antinomianist idiot, okay? Uh, thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not uh, commit adultery, okay? Thou shalt not bear false witness, okay? And, you know, some of these cutie pies with Romans 13. Let's go there. Romans 13, okay? We have to go through this process because, brethren, you would not believe the pettiness of the enemy when it comes to them wanting to justify themselves, Especially with the antinomianist idiots. Okay, these guys will nitpick every little thing in order to justify themselves and to justify their sin. I mean, I mean, some of these things, it's like, Brad, why are you even... That's the level of the mind of the enemy. Petty, juvenile, childish, children of the devil. But in Romans 13, verses 1 on verse 5... Let every soul be subject unto the higher powers. For there is no power but of God. The powers that be are ordained of God. Yes, that is true. Okay. <laughs> Trump, you know, and I now am wondering whether or not the Jesuits are going to put Trump in or put in Kamala Harris. Who would be worse for America? It would be Kamala Harris. Anyway. Yes. God allows those in power, for, especially, example, America, Smoking Joe is the front man acting so-called president. He's there for judgment against this nation. Absolutely. You know, macaroni guy, who is not the son of perdition, grinder, you jerk. Okay. Uh, he's the president of France for judgment against France. And you look at the Olympics, I rest my case. Okay. All right. So yes, that is true. Okay? Whosoever therefore resisteth the power resisteth the ordinance of God. And they that resist shall receive to themselves damnation. Oh, and people like that. See, you gotta go to get your degree at a cemetery school. Be trained by Jesuits. That's not what that's talking about. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to the evil. Wilt thou then not be afraid of the power? Do that which is good, and thou shalt have praise of the same. And there is none good but God. In the book of Acts, you don't see anyone going to the Pharisees, except Saul, who would eventually get converted and be called Paul, for the reason to attack the church, church of God. Okay? All right? Yeah. You don't see in Scripture someone going to a state, or anything to get permission to preach or to get married. And that's not what this is addressing, okay? For he is the minister of God to thee for good. But if thou do that which is evil, be afraid, for he beareth not the sword in vain. For he is the minister of God and a revenger to execute wrath upon him that doeth evil. Wherefore ye must needs be subject, not only for wrath, but also for conscience sake. Obey the law. Obey the law. 
Don't steal. Don't kill. It says 55, do 55. Okay? <laughs> that kind of thing. That's what that's talking about. It has nothing to do with God sending laborers into his field or what God hath joined together. It has nothing to do with that. Okay? And while we're here, verse 9, skip a little. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Thou shalt not covet. And if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in the saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And you cutie pie. It's like, doesn't say anything. <laughs> I've encountered this. And from an antinomianist, no doubt, of course. Of course. Of course. You guys are just idiots. Anyway. I've encountered what Paul doesn't say anything about uh, idolatry there. So you're saying it's okay. Dude. Dude. Okay. All right. We'll move. <laughs> Have you read First and Second Corinthians before? Have you? How about Acts chapter 17? Just, just off the shot there, okay? I think it's Acts 17 where he's stood by uh, Mars Hill, yeah, I think, I think that is, either that or Acts 19, one of you can correct me, but have you ever read First and Second Corinthians where Paul talks about, about idolatry and idols and idol worship and stuff like that, have you ever read that before, sweetie pie? Yeah, <laughs> you haven't, have you? <laughs> have you? Anyway, anyway, so the argument, to defend the argument that you need to go to the state to get married, and they come to these places, it does not hold water at all. Okay? Because that's not what it's encompassing. Okay? So, your defensive measures to defend the Jesuit order uh, fall flat on their face scripturally. Now, Genesis 19, I, I had written down yesterday, all, you know, uh, Mary... Married, marriage, marrieth, marriages. We don't need to do go through all of those. But we are going to address a few things here. Genesis 19 is the first appearance of any variation, any variation of to be married, marry, marriage, any variation. The very first appearance is in Genesis 19. And what? Number one, first point, marriage is between a man and a woman. I have had converse with sodomites about this. God declares marriage to be married between one man and one woman. We will talk about, we will address polygamy, don't get ahead of me. We will be, we will be addressing polygamy, okay? So, don't get ahead of me. But marriage in the eyes of God is one man, one woman. Okay? God, you could go to a Unitarian or a Universalist who tells you love is love. They are of Satan. They work for the Vatican. Marriage is a man and a woman. Period. Genesis 19, 12 on to 14. Therefore, say, am I in the right place? Oh, no, I'm not. <laughs> and Lot went out. 12 on to 14. In Genesis 19. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any, any besides, son-in-law and thy sons, and thy daughters? And whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is... Because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out, and spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Now that's the first appearance. If I'm wrong, someone will correct me in the comment section. Okay, if I'm wrong. Uh, but I, 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 I wrote them all down. <laughs> okay. Anyway, that's the first appearance of any variation of Mary, marriage, of marriages. Okay. What do you see in verse 14? 
sons-in-law married daughters, man and woman. Okay? Man and woman. Genesis 38. Genesis 38. Now, I want you to, if you can, make a mental note of this one, because we're going to make a reference onto it later about, you know, for example, an arranged marriage. Okay? Excuse me. Had some pistachios. Genesis 38, 6 on the 10. And Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, whose name was Tamar. Ur, Ur. And Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord slew him. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. So, also with verse 8, we see number 1, number 1, a man and a woman. Okay? Look, you sodomites out there, you two dudes, uh, you... <laughs> You, 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 sure, you're married in the eyes of the state. In the eyes of God, that's, that's, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. Okay? The Lord can deliver you. The Lord can save you. Absolutely. Amen, amen. It's not like what sodomite Stephen Anderson himself says. Okay? The Lord can save you and get you out of that. But in the eyes of God, that's, that's, that's abhorrent. That's abomination. Okay? You two dudes think you guys are married in the eyes of God? You went to the Unitarian thing over there in McHenry, right? Or something like that? No. No, it's an abomination in the eyes of God. Marriage is a man and a woman. Period. All right, so we see in verse 8 again. And Judah said unto Onan, Go in unto thy brother's wife, and marry her, and raise up seed to thy brother. You also see the introduction of copulation. Okay? And by the way, this is we are going to be addressing adult themes in this video. And we're not going to be like the uh, antinomianists who are vulgar, profane, and nearly pornographic when they talk about stuff. And, and yeah, and these guys are, and those guys are saved, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Give me a break. Give me a break. And Onan knew that the seed should not be his. And it came to pass when he went in unto his brother's wife that he spilt it on the ground, lest he should give seed to his brother. Okay. So this is also introducing the aspect of copulation, consummation, if you will. Copulation, we're using that term, okay? And that going, coincides with marriage. Coincides with marriage. With marriage, okay? And the thing which he did displeased the Lord, therefore he slew him. Also, too, you got to remember, as with the kings, and we will address this later, that Israel was being built was being in building during this time and also during the time of the kings. You also got to remember that, all right? But verse 6, Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn. Remember that. Judah did it for Ur, his firstborn. Took a wife for his son. Hence, an arranged marriage. Arranged by who? Judah, okay? That still happens today, as I understand it, in some Islamic countries and some um, uh, Middle Eastern countries, even. Okay, I, as I understand, that still happens. As uh, and also too, if I'm not mistaken, that also happens in some, uh, like in North, North Korea, I think, and also in some areas of Thailand, Shemitic countries. Okay, as I understand it, as I understand it. Okay, Exodus 21. Exodus 21. So marriage, scripturally, is a man and woman. One man and one woman. Don't get out of me. Exodus 21, verses 1 unto verse 11. 
Now, these are the judgments which thou shalt set before them. If thou buy an Hebrew servant, six years he shall serve, the, serve, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. If he came in by himself, he shall go out by himself. If he were married, then his wife shall go out with him. Self-explanatory. If the dude has a wife, and they come under service of a, a fellow Hebrew, there it is, okay? Verse 4. If his master have given him a wife. Ah, so we see Judah took a wife for Ur, and we see under the servitude, servitude here, a master giving a wife unto a servant. Okay, we see that. And she have borne him sons and daughters. The wife and her children shall be her masters, and he shall go out by himself. Okay? Verse 5. And if the servant shall plainly say, I love my master, my wife, and my children, I will not go out free. Then his master shall bring him unto the judges. He shall also bring him to the door, or unto the doorpost. And his master shall bore his ear through with an awl. A-U-L. Uh, and he shall serve him forever. That's the closest you're going to get to a man with an earring thing right there in Scripture. I mean, there are like the Ishmaelites that wear earrings and stuff like that. But right there, you know, that's a good one right there. It's like a God sanctifying a form of an earring. And what was it for? Okay. Because you, you read about how they broke off their earrings and stuff like that. The Ishmaelites wore earrings and stuff like that. Yes. Yes. Scripturally, you got the guy putting his, okay, if any of you, I got my ear pierced, okay, uh, you know, you put a potato behind it, and then you take a needle, a hot needle, and go like that, same principle, okay, but why were they doing that? We just read the context, okay, let's continue, and if a man shall sell his daughter to be a maidservant, she shall not go out as the men servants do, if she please not her master who hath betrothed her to himself. Then shall, she, then shall he let her be redeemed. To sell her unto a strange nation, he, hath, he shall have no power, seeing he hath dealt deceitfully with her. And if he hath betrothed her unto his son, he shall deal with her after the manner of daughters. If he take him another wife, her food, her raiment, and her duty of marriage shall he not diminish. Okay? if he take another wife. Remember too at this time Israel was in the establishment being made into a great nation when the, the thing of the kings, okay? And we're going to address that a little later more in depth, okay? We're going to address that more in depth. Uh, Israel was still becoming a great, great nation. But also there was a big problem with the polygamy, which we will address later in its entirety, okay? But the duty of marriage. See, also too, remember, God wanted, from the beginning, man and woman, one man, one woman. God did allow polygamy. Yes, he did. Was he for it? No. Because of what happened when with polygamy, especially with the kings. And, you know, the, the main king dies and then there are so many sons. It, war, bloodbath, killing each other. And stuff like that, okay? But we'll address that later. Let's continue. And if he do not these three unto her, then shall she go out free without money. Duty of marriage. Duty of marriage. Okay? A duty. When you are married, you have a duty. Both of you do. Not just the man, okay? And now Psalm 78. Psalm 78, just one verse. Okay, Psalm 78, just one verse, 63, Psalm 78, 63, just one. The fire consumed their young men, and their maidens were not given in marriage. So, uh, clearly, according to Scripture, according to Scripture, marriage is one man, one woman. We will address polygamy. Don't worry. Don't get ahead of me. But man and woman, woman and man, man and woman, that's what marriage is, okay? 
Now, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. Verses 26 on to 28. Now, there will... I'm going to put the whole uh, playlist for the... Um, about the Godhead in the description box. Okay? Trinitarians come to this portion and they say, see us. It's talking about persons. Persons is not mentioned there. It's not talking about a three-person God. That is satanic. That is heresy. Any questions about the Godhead uh, will be in the description box. Okay? Well, that's not the focus of this video. Okay? God is one God comprised of spirit, soul, and body. Not one God comprised of three persons. That is satanic. That is of the devil. That is pleh, heresy. That is dung. Okay? To hell with the Trinity. Okay? Like I said, we, we got, you know, that's not the focus of today. In the description box will be videos on the Godhead. Okay? So, Genesis chapter 1, we want verses 26 on the 28. God said, Let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, and the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. There's only two genders. Only two, male and female. Anything else is a fairy tale. Anything else is of Satan. Okay? Image of God. You and I have a spirit. Hey, nitwit! Read 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It's, we have a spirit. We have a soul. We have a body. That's in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. That is how it is worded. Why do some of you like to put body first? I wonder. But that's just that's just a small thing. Is that a salvific issue? No, it isn't. It's just one of those little things that grind my gears. Okay? If you're going to quote it, get it right. It's spirit, soul, and body. Okay? Not backwards. Because if you're saying it backwards, what are you putting first? Oh, I'm, I'm uh, giving glory to Jesus. Oh, shut up. Anyway, anyway, not important. Okay? It is important because it says spirit, soul, and body. But we're not going to make a big issue of that. Okay? And God said unto them, and what are we reading to? On the verse 28. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth, male and female. Man is made in the image of God with the spirit, soul, and body. Little uh, Fluffy, little Xena, they have, they have a body, they have a spirit, but they don't have a soul. Okay? Spirit of the earth, spirit of the beasts that descendeth downward to the earth. Animals don't have souls. Why are we bringing this up? Marriage is between a man and a woman, between mankind. You, dude, you're not going to find anywhere, not even the, in the Apocrypha, are you going to find anything that mentions a marriage between animals? Okay? All right? Marriage is between mankind. Woman is of man, mankind. Okay, a man and a woman of mankind. Okay, mankind are the ones given on to marriage, are allowed to uh, get married, okay? I bring this up also because I have seen, whoo, okay? People actually, and you can find this. I think it was a one of them short videos off of that uh, Chinese TikTok or whatever it is where people actually legally got married to inanimate objects and even an animal. I wish that was being said to you to make a point. You can find it about how people had married, like, I, I, as I remember, somebody actually uh, married the Roman Colosseum. 
<laughs> I, I don't have the link for that. I, 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 if I want to search the history of things I saw, I'm sure I can find it. I'm not going to go through that. But marriage is number one, man and woman, between mankind. Okay, and only mankind has a spirit, soul, and body. Okay? All right, now, Genesis 2. Let's look at the very first marriage in Scripture. Now, you cutie pies out there, well, marriage isn't mentioned there. I, I know it's not. But it's being described, and that's what it is. Okay? It, it, you can liken that onto the thing about born again. Paul never, and see this, that, see, this is the level of the pettiness of these people, of their infinitesimal little juvenile minds that have been blinded by Satan. You know, so, well, you know, because the, like example, the antinomianists like to say, because they're all about sin, uh, they like to say that, well, only being born again is just for the Jews. Paul never talked about it. You're right. He just defined what it meant to be born again. You're right. Paul never said born again in the Pauline epistles. Find it. He just defined it. Same principle. Marriage is not mentioned. <laughs> but brethren, that's the level of pettiness that these, especially these antinomianists and Catholics, one and the same, okay? That's the level of these people's minds to justify sin. That's what these people do, okay? I know, it's juvenile, it's petty. That's what they do, okay? You have to understand that. All right, but Genesis 2, verses 18 on to 25, we're going to have some expository here, okay? Genesis chapter, not 3, Brad, you're in the wrong place. Genesis 2, verses 18 on to the close of the chapter. And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Even with some of you sisters, you are of man. Woman means of man. We're going to see this. There are some of you sisters out there. Sisters! Saints! Who struggle with this. You were made for the man, not vice versa. There are some of you sisters out there who I love, who we love, saints, who struggle with that. Okay? Deal with the scripture, beloved. Okay? And of course, the Christian women who look like whores, we're not even talking about them. Okay? We're not, because, we're not, okay, because, hey, you got a woman preacher? Even Dade Murphy can rightly refute the pr women preacher thing, okay? Even that guy can do that, all right? But, and the Lord God said, it is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him and help meet for him. Now, our Lord talks about, you know, there are some eunuchs made for the kingdom of heaven, kingdom of heaven. And Paul, okay, himself, was never married. There are those out there who say that Paul was married once. You show that to me in Scripture, and I'll agree with you. I, I, I have. I've heard that from, uh, from Christians, of course, from the yea hath God said crowd. So, well, Paul was married. Show me that in Scripture. Well, in order to be the high priest, he had to have been married. Show it to me in Scripture. Well, the great... Shut up! Show it to me in Scripture! Okay? You can't prove that Paul was ever married in Scripture. Actually, the opposite is the truth. Paul is a virgin. We'll look at that. Okay? We'll look at that. But 1 Corinthians 11. 1 Corinthians 11. Verses 1 on verse 9. Sisters. Women. Christian women. You know. You, you blessed hemetic people. You blessed brethren of Ham. And you blessed sisters of Ham. Uh, you see one of your kindred, uh, the Hermetic women, you know, preaching, you know, 
God gave me a message. I'm going to bless you financially. Why aren't you rebuking these people? You get on me, some of that, some of y'all get on me and calling me a kindredist for doing that. Then okay, why aren't you doing it? Okay? Give me a break. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 1 on the word, verse 9. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am, am of Christ. Paul is not talking about setting up his own little sect, like King James Bible believing Christianity, or anything like that. No, he's saying to you, he is the example of the saint for today. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. But, remember, Paul was the apostle unto the Gentiles. But, Romans chapter 1, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. A Greek is a Gentile. You read the book of Acts. Where, what did Paul do? He went to the Jew first, okay? Even though he was the apostle of the Gentiles, okay? Yes, he was. Peter was the apostle unto the circumcision, the Hebraic Jewish people, okay? That's why Rome wants to affix themselves onto that because they are replacement theology, okay? Verse 2. Now, I praise you, brethren that ye remember me in all things and keep the ordinances as I delivered them to you. It's talking about what was written in Scripture. Okay, not your traditions, Catholic. But I would have you know, the head of every man is Christ. And, sister, you are mankind. You came out of man. Okay, so that applies to you. And the head of the woman is the man. And the head of Christ is God. Okay? Every man praying or prophesying. How do you prophesy today? The Spirit of God, the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father that dwells within me, is speaking to you through the Scriptures. Okay? Me speaking to you Scripture. The Spirit's identified. That is prophesying today. It is not giving extra scriptural revelation. We have the completed canon of scripture. You see these nitwit Pentecostal devils giving all these are like, I, I'm prophesying. And what they do is, number one, they prophesy things out of the dispensation. And it is always contrary to the dispensation and contrary to scripture. Prophesying today is this. A saint preaching the word of God, the Lord within them, preaching through them to you. That is prophesying today. Okay? So, every man praying or prophesying, having his head covered, dishonoreth his head. Okay? Now, you might say, well, are you saying that it's wrong for me to preach with a cowboy hat on? What about praying? you got to remember, too, at that time, the Hebraic Jewish people wore kippers, yarmulkes, okay, and covered their head, all right? And the covering was supposed to be, in the Old Testament times, symbolic of the Holy Ghost covering them. But today, in this dispensation, the Holy Ghost, the Lord is that Spirit, our Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, dwells within us. That's why we aren't covering our heads. Get it? You know, it's like where two or three together are gathered, uh, together in my name, there am I in the midst. Wait a minute. Today that does not apply because the Father is within the saint. Okay? All right? Be aware of that. Be aware of that. Verse 5. But every woman that prayeth or prophesieth with her head uncovered dishonoreth her head. For that is even all one as if she were shaven. For if the woman be not covered, let her also be shorn. But if it be a shame for a woman to be shorn or shaven, let her be covered. And the covering of a woman is supposed to be the man. Okay? Alright? For a man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God. But the woman is the glory of the man. That's why, that's what has led into this disturbing thing of women putting on war paint. This is, has led to the disturbing trend, as it were, 
of women putting on a face, putting on war paint, and also dressing up a certain way to look, you know, because they are the glory of man. That's not what that means. We're going to look at that in Peter, the, um, you know, the hidden man of the heart. Okay, we're, we're going to address that later. Okay, all right. But see, a woman who feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. She shall be praised. And let her own works praise her in the gates. Not herself. But let her own works, let another man praise thee, and not thine own lips. Okay? A woman who feareth the Lord, and I know several of them. Saints, sisters, I know several of them. Okay? She is to be praised. Hence, the true glory of man. A godly, God-fearing woman. That's what that's a reference on to. Not the outer appearance. That doesn't mean that you should be walking around looking like an unkempt bed. Okay? You know? But, there again, it's the hidden man of the heart. And who's the hidden man of the heart? Okay? <laughs> All right? Let's continue. For man, for the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. And we're going to look at that. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. And of course, though, man comes from woman in childbearing. Okay? But at the beginning, right there. Sister, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? The Father hath created you for a glorious purpose. And why do you want to be doing things that a man does? Why? Man's supposed to preach, not you. That doesn't mean that you can't be a witness outside there. But you got to remember, hey, Mr. Dudley, do right. When you put your lovely help meet on a public forum like YouTube like this and have her Broadcasting stuff, I wonder where you got that from. Okay? You are putting her in a public access where men are going to be instructed. The Lord rebuke you. Okay? Gee, I wonder where you got that from. <clears throat> anyway. Anyway. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the woman to have power on her head because of the angels. Covering. Okay? Covering. You're not married. Your covering is the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? That covering of the Lord Jesus Christ doesn't be removed when you're married, by the way. But what happens is the man whom you were created for. That's a glorious purpose. To keep, be a keeper at home. To raise the children if there are any. Okay? To be behind your man. To support him. To smack him when he needs it. Okay? Okay? That's glorious. Why? Why? I don't get it. Verse 11. Nevertheless, neither is the man without the woman. Neither the woman without the man Lord. Okay? Now, 1 Corinthians 14, uh, addressing a little bit of what we were just talking about, where you see these women who will try to justify them preaching. Well, I'm preaching just to women. Dude, listen to me, dude. You put your videos on YouTube here. You're a woman. You're a king, game, Bible, even woman, huh? You're a sister, even. Okay? You're putting your thing here on YouTube. Men are going to see it. You might, you can say that you're, it's aimed for women all day all long. That's whatever. Men are still going to see it. You are still instructing men. You are doing contrary to the scripture. Even Dade Murphy has pointed that stuff out too. That's evil. That's contrary to scripture. And some of you King James Bible believing Christians are justifying that. That's wicked. 
Okay, that doesn't mean that you assist her outside the door in a, in a personal setting, you know, like what my wife did with that when we were at the Walmart. I showed up and then they ran away, okay? But, I mean, that doesn't mean that a sister can't be a witness or even quote scripture to people. But when it comes to this, teaching, preaching, you put your lovely helpmeet on camera in a public thing like this, you are contrary to scripture, period. Period. You can do all the yay hath God said garbage you want there, Mr. Dudley, do right. You're contrary to scripture, the Lord rebuke you. Lord rebuke you. I wonder where you got that from. Grinds my gears, man. 1 Corinthians 14, 34 to 37. Hmm. Let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. And also, too, uh, the woman of God, uh, the two-part video on the woman of God will be in the description box for you. Okay? And also, too, you want also other scriptural refutations of women preaching? Check out the charismatic videos. Okay? All right. Let's continue. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for a woman to speak in the church. Meaning preaching and stuff like that. Okay? Does that mean that you can't be like, uh, meaning, you know, the body, you know, like say, when, you know, we had the brethren over here, uh, they, were, they were speaking, the body of Christ gathered together. We are the church. Okay? Does that mean that they couldn't say anything to, like, hi? Say, no. Okay. Okay. Under obedience as saith the law. And if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. Learn. Speak. A woman is not to preach or teach. Doesn't mean that you can't say hi. Or have to use sign language or anything like that. Okay? It's in regards of preaching, teaching. That's what us men are supposed to do. Verse 36. What? Came the word of God out from you? See? See? Verse 36 explains it. That he's talking about the preaching. Okay? Or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. You also too got to be careful and see... You got to get out of your mind the church building thing. The church building thing is not ordained of God. The church buildings are based off of Rome. So when you have these Christian women in a satanic phallus house gossiping like bah, 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 that doesn't apply for them anyway. But when you have a gathering of saints together with the scriptures having fellowship okay, number one Saints aren't going to be blah, 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 like that. But when it comes to, okay, all right, hey, let's, let's, let's get our scriptures. That's the man's job. Okay? All right? Now, go back to Genesis chapter 2, verse 19. And out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every fowl of the air and brought them unto Adam to see what he would call them. And whatsoever Adam called every living creature, that was the name thereof. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of every and to the and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found an help meet for him. I have encountered people wanting to justify bestiality coming to this. Well, Adam had, Adam copulated with animals. I've encountered that. The Lord rebuke you. You vile, disgusting cretin. That's disgusting. That is disgusting. Okay? No, Adam did not copulate with animals. That's not what that means. Lord, I've encountered that, brother. Okay? I have encountered that. Like I told you, 
The level of, that people will go to to justify their sin is full of wonder. Okay? All right? You, you, you'd be amazed at what I've encountered at people seeking to justify their sin. Okay? And the Lord God... And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man, he made, made he a woman. And brought her onto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. What does woman mean? Because she was taken out of man. Verse 24. Therefore shall a man leave his father and mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. Let's read verse 25 because we're going to concentrate on verse 24. And they were both naked. Naked. The man and his wife and were not ashamed. Between man and wife. You know, you can, if you want to walk around in your birthday suit, make sure the blinds are closed. But between a man and a wife being naked in front of your husband or, or your wife, it, it, it ought not to be a problem. If it is, there's deeper issues. Okay? But, verse 24, one flesh. Now, I have heard a while ago, uh, there was some young kid um, who was uh, involved with a certain sect of King James Bible believing Christians who did a, I forget what his name was, it's not important. He did a video where he said copulation was marriage. Sex was marriage. No. No, it isn't. Copulation is an integral part of marriage. Amen. But that, in and of itself, is not marriage. Its association with marriage is very significant, which is why God doesn't want us to not be virgins before we marry. Okay? And think about this. We had discussed this uh, yesterday. Um, the devil is so sexualizing everything, especially with the Christian women, okay? Wearing, you know, looking like whores, wearing tight things and stuff like that. But that's okay with Christianity, okay? No, no it isn't. No it isn't. All right? See, the integral part of copulation within marriage is so significant that that act is reserved between man and wife. So when you outside of marriage decide to take that which is designated between man and wife, like most of us have, okay? But the one flesh thing, one flesh does, enco does encompass copulation. It is not the thing in and of itself. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. Mark chapter 10. We want verses 2 on to verse 12. Okay? And when you, let's say you're not married and you have children outside of marriage, um, that's... Uh, consummation children are present okay that then that's when you, you know you, you guys you know if you know consider being married <laughs> getting married yes yes okay anyway mark chapter 10 verses 2 on to verse 12 and the pharisees came to him and asked him is it lawful for a man to put away his wife, tempting him, tempting him. And he answered and said unto them, What did Moses command you? 
And they said, Moses suffered to write a bill of divorcement and to put her away. And Jesus answered and said unto them, For the hardness of your heart he wrote you this precept. Key verse right here. But from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. Male and female. Notice it does not say males and females. Male and female. From the beginning, Genesis, of creation, God made them male and female. God's intent for marriage has always been from the beginning. One man, one woman. We will get to polygamy. Hold your horses. Okay? For this cause, and we just read this, shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. And they twain shall be one flesh. So then they are no more twain, but one flesh. You've heard the other half thing, right? Right? So when you are married in the eyes of the Lord, one, fl one flesh involves the bed. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. But there's a lot more to it than just the bed. And see, that's the problem with a lot of the marriage of today. They, one flesh, they leave it only in the bed and not intuiting that being one flesh literally means that you two are one. You're, in the, you're separate individuals, but you are one cohesive unit. Okay? My wife is my flesh. I am my wife's flesh, even though we're not in the bed. Okay? All right? And see, that's the problem. That's why divorce rate is like through the roof, because of the disposable society and stuff like that. Okay? All right? That marriage is more than the bed. That's an integral part of it, yes. It's kind of like how you cement the deal, uh, as it were. Okay? Okay? But being one flesh encompasses so much more than just the bed. And see, a lot of people get married with that process of thought that we're one flesh in the bed. And then you guys can't get along outside of it. And then you wonder why you're constantly butting heads. Huh? Dude, if that's the basis of your marriage, I'm pointing at bed. Um, <laughs> Get thee behind me, Satan, for thou savorest not the things that be of God, but the things that be of man. Verse 9, what therefore God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. What if God is not the one who put them together? Have you ever thought about that? <laughs> you ever thought about that, huh? What if you two put you, yourselves together? Now, God can, in time, come along and things could happen. Amen. Hallelujah. But what God has put together, let not man put asunder. Okay? What God has put together. What happens when God's not the author of your marriage? Does that mean that you can go ahead and get a divorce because, well, God's not... Uh, no. See, there's a permanence to marriage that a lot of people don't intuit until it's too late. And then when they realize that the bed is not the strongest foundation for your marriage, then you want to flee. No, 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 no. And we're going to look at divorce here a little bit later, okay? And in the house, his disciples asked him again of the same matter. And he saith unto them, Whosoever shall put away his wife and marry another committeth adultery against her. And if a woman shall put away her husband 
and be married to another, she committeth adultery. That crosses dispensational lines. If you are married, if you were married in divorce, or in the scripture, you're supposed to stay single. The exit of that is if one of the spouses die. Okay? And actually, we're going to be looking at that here in a little bit. But the thing about adultery, okay? If you're messing around with a, a formerly married woman, you got some troubles. Okay, you do. And, all right, some qu uh, quick verse references here. Leviticus 20. Leviticus 20, verse 10. Now, we're not murder, we're not stoning, killing people for adultery today. We are not doing that. Why are we not doing that? We'll, we'll, we'll explain that briefly. But Leviticus 20, verse 10. And the man that committeth adultery with another man's wife, even he that committeth adultery with his neighbor's wife, the adulterer and the adulteress shall surely be put to death. Okay? The sanctity of the marriage bed. The, the, you know, the thing between the husband and wife. Someone, I did that as a lost man. And you know what? I'm saved. I'm going to heaven when I die. I am forgiven for that. But that stigma, especially in my memory, has not been washed away. I'm forgiven of it. Yes, I am. But the consequences thereof, mostly in memories. Mostly in memories. Romans 12. Romans 12. Why, okay, Brad, why aren't, we, why aren't we doing that today? you got to rightly divide the word of truth, friend. That was another dispensation. But the adultery is still evil. Okay? Uh, Romans 12, verse 19. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay Seth the Lord. Okay? Under the law, there was no eternal security. Okay? So, you know, the dietary things there. Uh, the Lord dwelling within the believer permanently is that circumcision made without hands. You know, we can eat pork today. That kind of stuff. All right? But it was under another dispensation. Okay? But adultery is still evil in the eyes of God. Why aren't we stoning them today? Because eventually they're going to have to give an account of themselves to God. Now, you can be forgiven of that. Absolutely. Amen. Hallelujah. There is not a sin today that our Father cannot and will not forgive. But see, in forgiving you of that sin, that doesn't mean He's going to take away the consequences of it. Okay? you got to decipher that. And also, 1 Peter, no, 2 Peter 3, 2 Peter 3, one verse, 2 Peter 3, we want verse 9. 2 Peter 3, verse 9. For the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. You know, you're an adulteress or an adulterer. You, you, you are going to pay for it. Just not now. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to us word, us word meaning mankind, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. That's why we're not killing uh, people who are in adultery today. That happens in other nations, <laughs> okay, but uh, we don't kill them today. They are going to give an account of themselves and this dispensation. God would want God wants everybody to be saved. Yes, he does. Not everybody is going to be saved. Okay? Not everybody is going to be saved. Okay? Despite what the universalists uh, think. Oh, and incidentally, dude, uh, yeah, I know that the bald-headed guy is a universalist. Okay? Thank you very little. All right? Now, Proverbs... Six. Here's the thing about 
the adulterer. One, I had an affair. I had a three or four year affair with a married woman. A woman who I loved. She was married to another man. A man who I believe was is a saint. I believe he was a saint. I don't know if he's alive. He was a big man. Huge. Could <clears throat> pummel me in a heartbeat. But I believe he was a saint. And I was a lost man. And I loved that woman. And I was the other man. And I remember I, I talked with some Christians at the time when, you know, it's like, well, hey, you know, it could have been anyone else, you know. It wasn't anyone else. It was me. I'm forgiven of that. That's been washed away. That's not held against me in the eyes of the Lord, salvifically. But the consequence of it, those memories... See, and that's another reason why the Lord wants you to be a virgin before you're married to your wife or your husband. Because, okay, we're adults here. What happens when you're not married and you're fornicating with somebody? Memory gets in the way. And you compare, don't you? Don't you? You lie, and your breasts stink if you say otherwise. You do. That's a consequence. That's a consequence. It cleaves to you. I shall set no wicked thing before mine eyes. I hate the work of those that turn aside. It shall not cleave unto me. Forgiven? Absolutely. You go the way of the cross, broken, contrite, and in fear of him, you can't wait to call upon the name of the Lord and He saves you and seals you. You're forgiven. Once saved, always saved. Amen. They ate a sin today. Today. That our Lord cannot and will not forgive. Proverbs 6. 32 on to 35. But whoso committeth adultery with a woman lacketh understanding. Lacketh departing from evil. He that doeth it destroyeth his own soul. Dispensational difference. But a wound and dishonor shall he get. And his reproach shall not be wiped away. Now, like I said, the blood of Jesus cleanseth us from all sin. Okay? You go the way our Lord has elected. The way of the cross. He saves you, seals you. All your sins are forgiven. Okay? All your sins are forgiven. Yes. Consequence. Consequence, dear friend. Consequence. Those aren't taken away all the time. Our Lord can take away the consequences, yes. But most of the time, his reproach shall not be wiped away. For example, if I were to go to the man whose wife I laid with as a lost man, even as a saint, he would have every right to kill me. At least smack me around. He would. Now as a saint, he probably is like, I forgive you, but you get out of my face. The problem, man. For jealousy is the rage of a man, and the woman is the glory of a man. Sisters, women, have you ever have you figured it out why man will get um, envious, have jealousy? over you. Okay? Therefore he will not spare in the day of vengeance. He will not regard any ransom, neither will he rest content, though thou givest many gifts. They're one flesh. My body belongs unto my wife. My wife's body belongs unto me. Who in chades are you to get involved with what is in yours? 
can you can you kind of understand that aspect? I've been asked by sisters, you know, because they have uh, jealous, very or envious, I should say, uh, husbands. Um, it's like you, you gotta understand, you know, you're you're the glory of man. That that husband of yours, he, he thinks the world of you. Okay, you are his help meet. So when someone else, well, he should be. I know, but men. Men, you see, that's part of your purpose, What part of your glorious purpose as a woman, to strengthen your man. Not to lead others on in temptation, thinking that you still got a girlfriend. I come. Shouldn't he be happy that I still got it? I didn't even respond. I, just, I, I did. I, I sent a letter's reason together, you and I. So that no, 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 no. Save for ten years, and you're saying that. I I think perhaps maybe no. I think perhaps maybe no. Now, First Corinthians six. First Corinthians six. Now, here comes the admonition. You might be thinking, well, okay, then why not? You know, why not? You know, we're not married, huh? Why not? Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, nay, nay. <laughs> First Corinthians 6, verses 15 unto 20. Know ye not, now this is for saved people. Know ye not that your bodies are the members of Christ? Shall I then take the members of Christ and make them the members of an harlot? God forbid. What? Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body, for two, saith he, shall be one flesh. Now that right there is clearly, clearly a reference onto copulation. You are one flesh with that individual. We're adults. Put that in relation with Sodom. Okay? But... You're fornicating? You are engaging in something that is reserved for the marriage bed. And you guys are just going to pass it off as a one night stand fling? Oh, nay, nay! <laughs> oh, nay, nay! That's not, no. No. That's, that's bad. Okay? But he that is joined unto the Lord is one Spirit, what God hath put together, let not man put asunder. Flee fornication, and the fornication adultery video will be in the description box. It will be the first one, okay? Flee fornication. Every sin that a man doeth is without the body, but he that committeth fornication sinneth against his own body. What? Saved people. You're lost. You, this does not apply to you. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own? For ye are bought with a price, the death, burial, and resurrection, the blood of Jesus Christ. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Looking at verse 16. Now that is a generalized statement. Okay? In context, he's like, for saved people, dude, what are you doing? Don't you, what, what? You're saved? You, you, you're going to mess around with a harlot? No. May she go, make her your wife? Then, okay. You're just fl flinging around? Oh, nay, nay. Okay? You lost people. Just willy, willy nilly. Being promiscuous, some of you. You're going to reap what you sow. You're going to reap what you sow. And then you wonder when you get into a marriage because you were not a virgin. Hey! Because you were not a virgin at marriage. Uh, you're going to have memories. You're going to unconsciously make comparison. Now some out there claim that that never comes up. Maybe, maybe. But most people, unfortunately, that and that's something that Satan will gnaw on as well. Okay? Hebrews 
13, 4. We had a very interesting um, discussion about this verse. We're not going to get into it today in this because that's not the point and that kind of will subtract a little from what we're getting at. Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage is honorable in all and the bed undefiled. But! That's a big hairy but. Whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. The marriage bed, the bed of marriage, sacred. Design, and the bed, marriage is honorable and all. That doesn't mean that between two men or two women. No, marriage is a man and a woman. Okay? Marriage is honorable and all, and all, and the bed undefiled. Man and woman in bed doing whatever is, okay? That was the discussion. We're not going to get off on that. We got, we, you know, we're, we're on a train here, okay? But, whoremongers, you know, being promiscu promiscuous, and adulterers, God will judge. Simple fact. Simple fact. If you're messing around with a married woman, you're in danger. That's sin. Okay? You are messing around with a woman who was once married. Okay? It's like, well, what am I supposed to do? It's like, hey, marriage in the eyes of God is a thing that is meant to, you know, to be a permanence. Okay? The Lord hateth putting away. There are uh, things for putting away. Yes, there is. And we'll look at that. But, you know, if you're going to moan and whine about things, you shouldn't have gotten married or you should never have gotten divorced. Well, he was doing this. We'll address that in a little later. A little later okay? 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 on to 7. 1 Peter 3, verses 1 on to verse 7. We made reference of this earlier. This, and also in Ephesians 5, which we're going to read, um, also encompasses the other aspect of one flesh. <laughs> one flesh in the bed. Obviously, duh, hello, McFly. But it's more than that. Likewise, ye wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, they also may without the word be won by the conversation of the wives. And that's a good verse to show you that conversation isn't only encompassing speech. Conversation meaning how you behave. Okay? One brother said that to me, and I think, I didn't you even use this verse to correct me on that, brother? I think you did. While they behold your chaste conversation coupled with fear. Whose adorning, let it not be that outward adorning of plating of the hair and of wearing of gold or of putting on of apparel. But let it be the hidden man of the heart. Who's the hidden man of the heart? It's supposed to be the Lord Jesus Christ, God our Father. Okay? And that which is not corruptible. And man's heart... The heart is deceitful above all things, okay? Again, you can tie in 1 John chapter 3 about the Holy Ghost, God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord is that spirit dwelling within us, okay? You can make that reference with this too, okay? Even the ornament of a meek and quiet spirit, which is in the sight of God of great price. Meek and quiet spirit. And how can you be meek and quiet when you're a Christian woman in a church building gossiping and doing all this nonsense? Hmm? See, and sister, this is what you're supposed to be. What about us? Rome, uh, Proverbs 31, verses 1 on to verse 9. A sister once said, if a man of God is doing as God would have him to do, it's easy for that sister to do as she is to do. 
Amen to that. For after this manner in the old time, the holy women also who trusted in God adorned themselves being in subjection unto their own husbands. Another thing that was brought up uh, yesterday in conversation was a woman who refuses to take her husband's name. Hmm. Hmm. It's like, okay, willing to do this, that, and the other thing, but I'm not going to take your name. My wife, she was the, the catalyst. I mean, we were going to do it anyway, because we ignorantly uh, went through the state and stuff like that. We, if, if we knew then what we knew now, we would have never have done that. We would have done the name change, but, you know, just, you know, take my last name upon her. But when a woman doesn't want to do that, that's a lack of subjection. There's still a little something there. Okay? And again, sister, women, this is what God intended for you. You bear children. You are to be the keeper at home. You are to be the runner of the household. You're, you know, it's like, you, you, you clean that up, you do that, okay? It's like that kind of stuff, okay? That's noble. That's glorious in the eyes of God. Why do you want what we do? Why do you want that? I don't get it. I don't get it. Well, I do, but I don't. Okay? It's part of the curse, you know, and he will rule over you. It's a different topic, okay? Verse 6. Even as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord, whose daughters ye are, as long as ye do well and are not afraid with any amazement. Likewise, Ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor unto the wife as unto the weaker vessel. There are some women out there that are very strong, very powerful. There are some women out there who know like this crazy uh, jujitsu stuff and can turn you into a pretzel. I have seen women, I have seen women where they saints know, point. I have seen women who can knock a man out. I saw a woman one time at a bar long ago, a gorgeously horish looking woman in a red dress, blonde hair. I've said this before. They were talking. I was sitting at this part of the bar, and over there they were making a ruckus, and this fine looking blonde haired woman, boom, headbutted the guy, and blood went out, you know. Weaker vessel. Weaker vessel. This stupid transgendery thing, where have you heard of this about a guy pretending to be a woman got into one of those UFC things with a woman, and the woman was just pelting the living snot. I watched it, uh, pelting the living snot out of this man who had fake tatas and was you know I, I'm sorry, uh, fake paps and was doing whatever and just took and this was a trained athletic woman who was good at jujitsu and a good striker and all that, he just took it and then choked her out with a rear naked choke. Weaker vessel. Okay? Also, women are more emotional than we are. Okay? You can make an argument. I've seen some very effeminate men who are emotional like women and neither effeminate, effeminate men our Lord doesn't like. Our Lord does, that doesn't mean that he can't save you. Okay, that does that's not what that means. If you're a man and being effeminate, that then oh nay nay. Okay? Alright. Likewise, ye husbands, dwell with them according to knowledge, giving honor to the wife, unto the wife, as unto the weaker vessel, and being heirs together of the grace of life, that your prayers be not hindered. Heirs together one flesh Ephesians 5 Ephesians 5 Ephesians 5 22 on to 33 wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands as unto the Lord for the husband is the head of the wife 
And when you have a, a situation where the woman is the one wanting to be the one in authority, that, that, oh, nay, nay, that's, that's, you got problems there. Sometimes, you know, a brawling, a brawling and contentious woman. That's when some of you, you know, and you, and, and uh, incidentally, I, I have to bring this up. This, this will be in the description box, too, okay? I, I have to uh, bring this up. Let me. There are some saints, some brethren out there who in there as a lost man have struck a woman in anger. Lord can forgive you of that. Absolutely. Will she? But you can be forgiven of that. Absolutely. Amen. But I'm going to tell you. You ain't no man if you strike a woman. You ain't no man. You're a coward. Now, if you're if a woman, if your wife is about to hack you to pieces with a butcher knife, that's a little different. Okay? All right? <laughs> Seriously, sisters, ladies, women, if you're going to attack a man with a butcher knife, or a meat cleaver, um, okay, that is a totally different scenario. Okay, number one, why was she doing that in the first place? Is she doing it to defend herself against you? Okay. Hmm. Or is she just going crazy and wanting to attack you? Okay. That's a different circumstance. But these men, <coughs> who in anger she, she was asking for it she got it in my face walk away she was doing this walk away little boy you ain't a man you strike a woman you ain't no man you ain't a man Lord can forgive you. Absolutely. Amen, amen. Lord in you. You think the Lord in you is going to be okay with you striking? No, nay, nay. The weaker vessel. And you're going to smack her because she didn't cook your spaghetti right? You ain't a man if you strike a woman. She's coming at you with a meat cleaver. That's a different scenario. But you, you know, you had a bad day at work. Yeah. You get mad because somebody cut you off in traffic. Uh, you're mad because of this, or angry, I should say, about this, that, and the other thing. And then big man, big tough boy, huh? You're going to come home and you're going to smack your wife, huh? Or, you, or you, your fornicating girlfriend, huh? You ain't no man, boy. You ain't no man. You ain't no man. Now, let's continue. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, and he's using this as an example of how Christ loves us, and also how we are to treat each other in marriage. Okay? Great example. Only God could give this. Okay? Therefore, uh, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be unto, let so let the wives be to their own husbands in some things. In everything. Don't get cute, okay? Um, God the Father that dwells within the saint is not going to be okay any way around for like someone wanting to go and kill someone. Okay, or to do poisonous thing to their bodies. You come up with something like that, you're trying to justify something. The Lord rebuke you. Seriously. Seriously. Drop it. See, you go that route, you're going the route of an antinomianist. Stop it. Stop it right now. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church 
and gave himself for it. I'm so, if it came to it, I'm supposed to die for that woman in there. But no, you have a bad day at work, and then you come home and smack her! You ain't no man. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. Twain, though they twain shall be one flesh. Love her as, so ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. They twain, though they too, will be one flesh. This is not talking about copulation. Is it? No, it isn't. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Her body belongs to me. My body belongs to her. She is my own body. Two, one flesh. Do you get it? That, that there, right there, ought to end it for you at all. If you're at all confused with the uh, one flesh thing meaning only copulation or sexual. Okay, that ought to end it for you. All right? For no man ever yet hated his own flesh nor nourisheth, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. For we are members of his body, of his flesh, and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they too shall be one flesh. See, now we saw that in three different dispensations. Okay? Crosses dispensational lines. Do you get it? Okay? Marriage is one man, one woman. Marriage is two becoming one flesh in the bed and in a spiritual fashion as we have just read. It's more than just the bed. This is a great mystery. But I speak concerning Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you in particular so love his wife even as himself. And, and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Now, Genesis 24. Genesis 24. Genesis 24. Remember we looked at Judah, how he chose a wife for, um, for Ur? Okay? What, uh, what God hath joined together, let not man put asunder. Okay? When God's the author. Well, what about when man's the author, huh? But Genesis chapter 24, Genesis chapter 24, we are going to start here for uh, verses 21 on to 26. Genesis 24, 21 on to verse 26. Now this was Abraham's servant going, uh, being sent out by Abraham to get a wife for his son Isaac of his own kindred. Okay, we're not going to go off on that thing about the kindred thing, that's a totally different subject, okay. But, he sent his uh, servant out there. Okay? So, and here we find the servant and Rebecca. And the man wondering at her held his peace, to wit, whether the Lord had made his journey prosperous or not. And it came to pass, as the candles had done drinking, that the man, now pay attention, that the man took a golden earring of half a shekel's weight, half a shekel weight, and two bracelets for her hands of ten shekels weight of gold. Show me a ring. Now, the servant prayed to the Lord. It's like, O oh Lord God of my master Abraham, uh, give me the woman, basically. Show me who you have chosen for Isaac. Okay, that's brad it, but that's basically what the servant said. Along comes Rebecca. This is ordained of God. Okay, number one about the ring thing. The ring on the finger, right? Okay? Alright? Number one, 
it was what? It was what? Golden earrings and bracelets. Who put them on her? Was it Isaac? No. It was the servant. Now you can get into whatever ritualistic thing you want to, but the fact is, did the husband himself put that on her? No. Okay, let's continue. And said, Whose daughter art thou? Tell me, I pray thee. Is there room in thy father's house for us to lodge in? And she said unto him, I am the daughter of Beth Bethuel, the son of Milcah, which she bare unto Nahor. She said moreover unto him, We have both straw and provender enough, and room in the room to lodge in. And the man bowed his head and worshipped the Lord. Okay? We looked at that specifically because, number one, God, the Lord, was the author. What God hath joined together, let not man, but a sunder. And also the thing about the uh, earrings and the bracelets that Isaac did not put on her. Okay? And there's no, like I said, you, you do your own work on the thing about the ring. Okay? Now, verses 67, uh, uh, 63 on to 67. Okay? And Isaac went out to meditate in the field at the eventide. And he lifted up his eyes and saw, and behold, the camels were coming. And Rebekah lifted up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she lighted off the camel. For she had said unto the servant, What man is this that walketh in the field to meet us? And the servant had said, It is my master. Therefore she took a veil and covered herself. And the servant told Isaac all things that he had done. Verse 67. And Isaac brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and took Rebekah, and she became his wife. And he loved her. And Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. So, what do we see? Isaac took Rebekah into the tent, and she became his wife. Obviously, there was some copulation involved there. Okay? We, obviously, there was some copulation involved there. And he loved her, and Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Took her into the tent. And we have already proven that the act of copulation itself is not marriage itself. It's an integral part of it, but it is not marriage in and of itself. That's part of it. Okay? We've, we've just been through it. Okay? Alright? Where is going to a preacher? Where is going to a judge? Where is going to the state? Hey. Oh, one more. Go to Ruth. Ruth. Ruth chapter 4. Ruth chapter 4. Okay? Like I said, we saw, remember I told you to remember about what's his name? Judah and Ur. Okay, an arranged marriage. And Ur was, you know, the Lord killed him. Ur, short for error. Okay? <laughs> but uh, Ruth 4, verses 9 unto 13. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day. Now here's the thing where you can go to about having witnesses. Okay? All right. Now, also, you could kind of tie in maybe a marriage ceremony, but, but it was more about the land and stuff like that. Okay. Bias the field of the hand of Nomi. Okay. And Ruth was just a part of that. Okay. So you could not go to Ruth to prove a ceremony. Okay as in standing in front of a judge or a Jesuit or whatever or going to the state. Here, though, you see a thing of having witnesses. Okay? All right? But also, as you see with Isaac, okay? Hmm. And Boaz said unto the elders and unto all the people, Ye are witnesses this day that I have brought all that I have bought all that was Elim Elex 
and all that was Kilians and Ma Ma Mahlons of the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Mahalon, have I purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead upon his inheritance, that the name of the dead be not cut off from among his brethren and from the gates of his place. Ye are witnesses this day. And see, the witnesses was more so for the purchase of the land. And the other part of it, or the benefit, was that of Ruth the Moabitess. Okay? And all the people that were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. The Lord make the woman that is come into thine house like Rachel and like Leah, which too did build the house of Israel. And do thou worthily in Ephrata, and be famous in Beth, Lechem, and let thy house be like the house of Pharez, whom Tamar bare unto Judah, and of the seed which the Lord shall give thee of this young woman. So Boaz took Ruth, and she was his wife. And when he went in unto her, the Lord gave her conception, and she bare a son. And of course, the lineage of David. Okay? Marriage, copulation. All part of it. Okay? Now, now, the original intent of marriage was one man, one woman. We have proven that. What about polygamy? What about polygamy? Having multiple wives. And uh, if a man, if someone is married still to someone, and gets married again. That's polygamy. Okay. Now, are, are you guys, uh, you know, you hear about this uh, with some of the things. Um, oh, who is it? Um, I think some of the Amish still do polygamy. And there are some cults, uh, like crazy cults that, you know, like the Branch Davidians. Uh, they were polygamists as well. Well, he was a polygamist. But uh, polygamy still does, especially in other nations, okay, there is polygamy still going on, okay? There is. What's the problem with polygamy? Number one, it was never God's intention. But why did God allow it? Remember, Rachel and Leah built the house of Israel. But during the time of the kings, Israel was expanding in order of prophecy to become uh, the st uh, more than the sand of the sea, uh, more than the sand and more than the stars, what I'm trying to say, okay? Israel was still in building, okay? 1 Kings 11, what was the problem with polygamy, okay? 1 Kings 11, polygamy is not okay. Okay? <laughs> if, if you're a dude and you've got two wives, if you're a wife and have like two, three husbands, <laughs> it's usually the husband that has multiple wives. That, oh, nay, nay. Okay? That's bad. Well, you, you're not a king trying to establish a kingdom. You're not a king on a throne trying to... Um, prolong the line of your kingdom, of your kingship. Okay? All right? Remember that. But, 1 Kings 11, verses 1 on verse 3. But King Solomon loved many strange women, not of his kindred, not of Shem. Together with the daughter of Pharaoh, a Hamite, Women of the Moabite, women of the Moab, Moabites, Ammonites, those are the children of Lot descendant, Edomites, Esau, um, uh, Israel's brother, Zidonians and Hittites, of the nations concerning which the Lord said unto the children of Israel, Ye shall not go into them, neither shall ye come, neither shall they come in unto you. Why? For surely they will turn away your heart after other gods. Solomon clave to these in love. You also got to remember the line from which Jesus Christ is come in the flesh 
was being established during this time period as well. You have to remember that. Okay? And he had 700 wives, princesses. Hey, sisters, one husband's enough, right? Hey, husband, one wife, <laughs> right? 700 wives. 700 wives. Wow! And 300 concubines. And his wives, his wives turned away his heart. Concubines. Uh, you will not find, I, um, um, I think, don't quote me on the, uh, hold on, hold on, I gotta check. Alright, so I had to check. Concubine, the word concubine and concubines never leaves the Old Testament. You will not find the word concubine or concubines in the New Testament. That was something that was reserved for kings. What is a concubine? Now, the thing about a concubine is they differed from a wife. For example, you have Leah, wife of Jacob, with her concubine Zilpah. Okay, and in scripture, Zilpah is never given the designation of a wife, but always a concubine. But she bear Isaac, uh, Jacob, to children. Same with Rachel, her um, con her maid servant, her whatever uh, was Bilhah, also designated as a concubine, not a wife. There's a difference between a concubine and a wife. And the word concubine, concubines, never leaves the Old Testament. It's an Old Testament thing, which was reserved for the kings, okay? Which was a thing of kings. What is a concubine? Okay, first appearance of, or the uh, concubine, um, Genesis 22. Genesis 22. Concubine, here it is. Genesis 22. We want verses 20 on to 24. 20 on to 24. Genesis 22. 20 on to 24. And it came to pass after these things that it was told Abraham, saying, Behold, Milcah, she hath also borne children unto thy brother Nahor, who's his firstborn, and Booz his brother, and Kemuel, the father of Aram, and Kesed, and Hazo, and Pildash, and Jidlaf, and Bethuel, Bethuel, and Bethuel begat Rebekah. These eight Milcah did bear to Nahar, Nahor, Abraham's brother. And his concubine, concubine, okay, concubine, whose name was Reuma, she bare also Teba and Gaham and Thahash and Makkah. Remember, uh, what's her name? Um, Hagar. The Egyptian was a concubine, never given the designation of a wife, okay? Why is that? And we also, um, uh, no, that, that's pretty much it for the concubine. Oh, wait, no, no, there's another one. Uh, 35, thir uh, Genesis 35, 22, one verse. Genesis 35, 22, just one verse. Genesis 35, verse 22. And it came to pass... When Israel dwelt in that land, that Reuben went and lay with Bilhah, his father's concubine, and Israel heard about it. Now the sons of Jacob were twelve. Bilhah, who bare Jacob two sons, but she was never designated as a wife. Remember, especially with what we just looked at, Israel was in its beginning stages. And during the times of the kings, Israel was still being made as the stars for heaven. You know, like in First, uh, uh, first Chronicles, the first uh, 15 chapters are all names, okay? God said that your descendants will be as the stars of heaven for multitude. But yet in First Chronicles verse, uh, chapters 1 under verse 15, you have a majority of them listed. Is that all of them? No, but what is there is there 
for uh, whatever, okay? The thing was that they were making children to establish Israel in the regards of prophecy as the stars of heaven, okay? That's not valid for today, all right? All right? And I wrote here, uh, they were building Israel, okay? Uh, Second Chronicles 21 now. And what would happen? with the polygamy okay look at david okay he messed around with bathsheba then he had absalom amnon and adonijah okay brothers killing each other for what to get to the throne okay oftentimes in antiquity his in historicity when a king would have many wives and concubines all kinds of children one would go to a throne and that one would go and kill all of his brothers. The problem with polygamy. Okay? All right, second um where am I keep Second Chronicles 21. Second Chronicles 21 verses 1 and verse 4. Second Chronicles 21 verses 1 and verse 4. Now Jehoshaphat slept with his father and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And J. G. Horam, his son, reigned in his stead. Okay? Many wives. Okay? He had many wives. He had a lot of children. He was a polygamist. And he had brethren, and he had brethren, the sons of Jehoshaphat, Azariah, and Jehiel, and Zechariah, and Azariah, and Michael, and Shephatiah, all these were the sons of Jehoshaphat, the king of Israel. And their father gave them gifts, great gifts of silver and of gold and of precious things with fenced cities of Judah. But the kingdom gave he to Jeroram because he was the firstborn. Look at verse 4. Now when Joram was risen up to the kingdom of his father, he strengthened himself and slew all his brethren with the sword and divers also of the princes of Israel. Why? Well, he was given the throne, but his brothers could have been, well, why not me? See, the problem with polygamy. It was done to ensure the line of the king. But yet, when the king would put one on the throne, look what happened with Solomon and Adonijah. The problem with polygamy. And like I said, concubine, okay, ends, I think the last of any variation is in the book of Daniel uh, with Nebuchadnezzar, I think. Okay, don't quote me on that. But this thing with the kings having multiple wives, okay, God allowed it, but he was never for it. Look at what happened. You have brothers killing brothers over a throne. Look at David. Okay, because of what he did. But nonetheless, Ammon and Tamar. Absalom. Adonijah. Okay? Right here. Right here. Jalom killed his brothers. Why? Because they could have been a threat to his throne. The problems with polygamy. Okay? Yes, God allowed it. He was bringing, you know, the line of Israel, that line from which the Lord Jesus Christ is come in the flesh, would come through, okay? Yes, yes, he allowed it. Was it his intention from the beginning? No. And today, you know, you read in Timothy, a bishop must be the, the husband of one wife. Well, that's just the bishop. Now, see, you say something like that, you're trying to justify you're what? You, you, you what? You're promiscuous, huh? You got a couple of... What, you think you're a king man? Huh? You got your wife and you got your own little concubines, huh? Lord rebuke you. What's wrong with you? What, you think you're a king? Poly polygamy is, not, is no bueno. No bueno. Okay? Oh, nay, nay. All right? All right? Now... Now, what about divorce? What about divorce? Catholics, 
Catholics, and I, I've, I've asked, uh, under no circumstances, uh, they are, are to divorce. Now, some may differ, but a lot of it is like you're in it to win it, no matter what. No matter what if your husband is cheating on you, or vice versa. No matter what if your husband is beating you. Because, now the thing about, you know, some will argue, well, if you're being abused by your husband, that's no, uh, that's not a ground for divorce. Uh, weaker vessel, supposed to love your own flesh, and you're beating your wife. Matthew 5. Now, you know, we talked about in uh, Mark, you know, where he says about adultery, and the video for that will be in the description box. Matthew chapter 5, 31 and 32. It hath been said, Whosoever shall put away his wife, let him give her a writing of divorcement. But I say unto you, that whosoever shall put away his wife, saving for the cause of fornication, causeth her to commit adultery. And whosoever shall... Marry her that is divorced, committeth adultery. Incidentally, it just got brought to my mind about the concubine again. What, what is a concubine? A concubine didn't have the designation of a wife. The concubine's purpose was the one aspect of what was supposed to be in marriage. The bed. Zilpha and Bilha, the concubines of Israel bear him two children apiece, but were not designated as wives. A concubine was there to produce offspring. Or to fulfill just that part. Whereas the wife was, you know, the twain one flesh thing. Okay? That's, sorry if I missed that. I was just reminded of that. Okay, now let's get back on topic. Okay? Matthew 19, verse 9. At Matthew 19, verse 9. Uh, at verse 8 and 9. Uh, 7 out of 9, excuse me. They say unto him, Why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? He saith unto them, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives. But from the beginning it was not so. One man, one woman. Okay? And I say unto you, Whosoever shall put away his wife, except it be for fornication, and shall marry another, committeth adultery. That crosses dispensational lines. Okay? Just because it's this current dispensation. Okay? And whosoever marrieth her which is put away, doth commit adultery. 1 Corinthians 7. 1 Corinthians 7. Can't get away from this topic without addressing 1 Corinthians 7. Okay? Fornication. Description box. Okay? Like I said, that will be the very first video where we, where we go scripturally and define the difference between adultery and fornication. Okay? But 1 Corinthians 7, verses 1 on to verse 5. Now concerning the things whereof you wrote unto me, it is good for a man not to touch a woman. I remember stupid head uh, Christy Burke. This was one of her things. <laughs> uh, that Paul was against marriage. And no, he wasn't. Okay, uh, The stupid head video of Christy Burke will be in the description box. Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. Now we saw in Genesis that the Lord said it is not good for a man to be alone. I will make him a help meet for him. And we already read in 1 Peter chapter 3, you dear sisters, you women out there, that role that God wants you to fulfill. And also you can read Proverbs 31. Okay, and us men, Proverbs 31, the first nine verses. We already looked in Ephesians 5 and 1 Peter 3 about us men. Okay? All right, but another aspect, another aspect of marriage is what? Is what? Nevertheless, to avoid fornication. 
Let every man have his own wife, and let every woman have her own husband. The problem is, people will get married for that alone. Okay? And we, 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 we hear when we read Ephesians 5, okay, we are supposed to love our wives as our own flesh, okay? So Paul encompassed both aspects of marriage. The uh, being one flesh as, uh, you know, being one flesh. She is my flesh. Nourishing, taking care of her, loving her, and stuff like that. And also the aspect of one's flesh, the bed. Okay? All right? So it's twofold. A help meet and also to avoid fornication. Okay? The wife hath not power of her own body, but the husband. And likewise also the husband hath not power of his own body, but the wife. Defraud ye not one another, except it be with consent for a time. Defraud ye, being in the bed. That ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer, and come together again, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. There are women out there who will use the bed as a weapon, and withhold themselves from their husbands in order to manipulate Men do that too. Men do that too. That that's cruel. That's wicked. And and that's another thing, you know, uh, Catholics like to tell you that Mary was a perpetual virgin. Uh if that were the case, Mary was in sin because she would be withholding herself from her husband. Okay? All right? So, yeah, don't believe Catholics when they tell you that garbage that Mary was a perpetual virgin. She was not. Okay, she had several children. She was a good woman to her husband. Okay? But see, withholding a consent for a time, not being together as one flesh in the bed, fine. But when you have one party of your marriage, so-called, using it as a means of manipulation or a weapon against you or just being a dead fish, There's a problem there. There's a deeper problem. Is God the author of it? Now, skip to 10 on to verse 17. Now, I know of a dear, dear, sweet, beloved brother to, uh, to whom this applies. Okay? Now, one might read 1 Corinthians 7 and get this idea that it's okay for a saved man to marry a lost woman, or a lost woman to marry a saved man. Uh, oh, nay, nay. Oh, nay, nay. It's not good. We're going to look at that, but let's, let's read. 1 Corinthians 7, 10 on the 17. And unto the Mary I command, yet not I, but the Lord. Let not the wife depart from her husband, but if she depart, let her remain unmarried or be reconciled to her husband. Let not the husband put away his wife. So, okay, you separate or whatever. Um, remain unmarried or be reconciled to your husband. If you can't be, well, I can't be reconciled. Well, you shouldn't have married him. Here's the thing that a lot of people with marriage don't want to accept. Okay, scripturally, when you take it upon yourself to be a husband or to be a wife, the Lord hates putting away. That is an intended lifelong commitment. Okay? We have read, because of the hardness of your heart, the Lord has allowed this precept. And unfortunately, saved people, uh, for whatever reason it happens, saved couples can depart from each other. But if they do, we have this right here. You're not supposed to get married again. And I know if there's one Christian woman who, Christian, who left her husband, still married, okay, still married, 
And I'd love to hear how they justify this. This is a good godly woman. A Christian woman. She Christian. Who left her husband for whatever reason we don't know. And has a boyfriend. She's still married. Has a boyfriend. Left her husband. Has a boyfriend. She good, good, uh, God very crazy and goes to a church building. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> like I said, um, I would love, I would love to hear, and uh, yeah, I would love to hear the gymnastics on how they get around that. I would love to hear that. Oh, nay, nay. Oh, nay, nay. But to the rest speak I, not the Lord. Note the distinction there. If any brother hath a wife that believeth not, and she be pleased to dwell with him, let him not put her away. A husband and wife get married, one of them gets saved. The wife is not saved. She wants to live with them great. And the woman which hath an husband that believeth not, and if he be pleased to dwell with her, let her not leave him. Vice versa. Works both ways. This is not a saved person going and getting married to someone who is lost. Oh, nay, nay. Oh, nay, nay. Nothing but trouble, man. Nothing but problems. Nothing but misery. Why? First Corinthians, Second Corinthians, chapter six. And I remember who it was. Uh, it was I was recollected of it yesterday night. Um, who said that first Second Corinthians six fourteen on to eighteen has nothing to do with marriage. Oh nay nay. What more intimate a fellowship is there than between a man and a wife? Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What, you're married and you're not having fellowship with your wife or husband? Don't give me that. Don't give me that. I know who said that. I, I'm not going to mention it. But I remember who said that. This it doesn't have anything to do with marriage. Yes, it does. What is the height of fellowship rather than a husband and a wife who are one flesh? You get off your high horse. Arrogant punk. Charlatan. Ugh. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what ultimate fellowship and communion, other, of course, with the Lord, but between persons, spirit, soul, and body, is there than with the man in life? Give me a break. And what concord hath Christ with Bilael? Bilael. Or what, ha what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? We already covered that. Okay? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them, and walk in them, and I will be their, their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, come out from amongst them, and be ye separate. Set the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you. And ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Now go back to what we were looking at in 2 Corinthians 7. Uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Okay? Picking up at verse 14. For the unbelieving husband is sanctified by the wife, and the unbelieving wife is sanctified by the children. Else were your children unclean, but now are they holy. So see, children are an important factor there when children are involved and here's the thing verse 15 but if the unbelieving depart let him or her depart a brother or a sister 
is not under bondage in such cases, but God hath called us to peace. You're married. You get saved. Your husband and wife don't. They want to leave you. Because I don't like you're a saint. You've changed. You're right, because I'm a new creature. But if the unbelieving depart, let him depart. A brother or a sister is not under bondage in any cases, but God hath called us to peace. For what knowest thou, O wife, whether thou shalt save thy husband? Or how knowest thou, O man, whether thou shalt save thy wife? But as God hath distributed to every man, as the Lord hath called every one, so let him walk. Even so ordain I in all churches. Okay? Now, in verses 25 on to verse 28, God right here, this is the fifth point, virgins. God wanted, wants, wanted us to be virgins until marriage. Verses 25 on to 28 in 1 Corinthians 7. Now concerning virgins, I have no commandment of the Lord, yet I give my judgment as one that hath obtained mercy of the Lord to be faithful. I suppose therefore that this is good for the present distress. I say that it is good for a man so to be, a virgin. Okay? All right, and I can't remember if we looked about the tokens of virginity um, in Genesis. I, I think we didn't, but you know about um, a woman, a maid was to be a virgin, a mer virgin maid. You know, give tokens, and if um, uh, are we going to read that? Uh, actually, we are going to read that. Never mind. Okay, getting ahead of myself. Art thou bound unto a wife? Seek not a wife. Seek not to be loosed. Excuse me. Art thou loosed from a wife, seek not a wife. But, and if thou marry, thou hast not sinned. And if a virgin marry, she hath not sinned. Nevertheless, such shall have trouble in the flesh, but I spare you. And see, it's right there that people will go and say, you see, Paul had a wife. Paul was married. You, you, yea, hath God said, Jesuit-trained, textual critic devil. You can't prove that at all. Actually, the opposite is provable, that Paul was a virgin himself. Your argument, well, he was going to be the high priest. He had to have one. You can't prove that. There is not one shred of evidence in Scripture to suggest that Paul was married. That's the closest you're going to get, and that doesn't even show anything of the kind. Lord rebuke you. Okay? Alright? Now go to Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22. I forgot. I, I, we did. We are mentioning this. Deuteronomy 22, verses 9 on to verse 11. Verses 9 on to verse 11. <laughs> Again, the thing about a lost and a saved person saved marrying a lost person. Oh, nay, nay. Okay. Could the Lord do something with that? Yes, he can. Yes, he can. Okay. But does that mean the Lord wants a saint to willfully go and marry someone who is lost? Oh, nay, nay. No. Thou shalt not sow thy vineyard with divers seeds. Lest the fruit of thy seed which thou hast sown, and the fruit of thy vineyard be defiled. Thou shalt not plow with an ox and an ass together, being unequally yoked. Thou shalt not wear a, gar I wear a garment of divers sorts, as of woolen and of linen together. It's like, uh, prayer, what is it? Well, remember, number one, that was under the law, okay, but instruction and in righteousness, and I brought this up to Brother Alexander Hartley yesterday about this and it's you know Paul utilizing instruction and in righteousness 1 Corinthians 9 9 and 10 1 Corinthians 9 9 and 10 okay for it is written in the law of Moses thou shalt not muzzle the mouth of the ox that treadeth out the corn doth God take 
care for oxen. Now what we just read isn't mentioning about uh, treading out the corn and stuff like that. But verse 10, or saith he it altogether for our sakes. Brr. All things that were written for uh, aforetime were written for our learning, that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. And these things were written for our example or in sample. I love that word. Okay. Making an example of things in the Old Testament. Okay. All right. Come on. <laughs> for our sakes, no doubt, is this written that he that ploweth should plow in hope, and that he that thresheth in hope should be partaker of his, his hope, his hope. So in Deuteronomy 22, verses 9 on to verse 11, that was, yes, under the law, but instruction and in righteousness, what fellowship hath light with darkness? A saint should not marry someone who's lost. Such shall have trouble in the flesh. Okay? God could use that. Amen! Amen! But the cost! The cost of being married to a lost person. That, I mean, yes, the Lord can use it. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah! You're going to be a punching bag, boy. Woman. So, it's nay-nay. And you're married, you get saved, your husband or your wife still lost, doesn't want anything to do with you, and they depart, go ahead. Go ahead. And the thing about uh, an abusive spouse, an abusive husband, we're supposed to take care of our wives as our own flesh. Okay? You're not a man if you're striking a woman. Period. And I believe that the Lord would allot for someone, for a wife to depart from her husband. For that, especially. Okay? Alright? Now, while we're in Deuteronomy 22, let's read verses 13 on to verse 19. The thing about the virgin. God intended us to be virgins until we met our spouse, our husband, or our wife. Okay? 13 on the 19. If any man take a wife and go in unto her and hate her and give occasions of speech against her and bring up an evil name upon her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her I found her not a maid, meaning a virgin. Then shall the father of the damsel and her mother take and bring forth the tokens of the damsel's virginity. Right there, uh, verse 15 is explaining, verse 14 unto the elders of the city in the gate. And the damsel's father shall say unto the elder, elders, I gave my daughter unto this man to wife. See, the man giving the daughter unto the husband. Okay, he gave it to her. You got it right there. Right there. Okay. <clears throat> and he hateth her. And lo, he hath given occasions of speech against her, saying, I found not thy daughter a maid. And yet these are the tokens of my daughter's virginity. And they shall spread the cloth before the elders of the city. Use your imagination. And the elders of that city shall take that man and chastise him. And we're, we're not going to talk about with, uh, in verses 20 onward, if um, she isn't a virgin. Okay, we're not going to talk about that because that's obvious. But, and they shall immerse him in a hundred shekels of silver, and give them unto the father of the damsel, because he hath brought up an evil name upon a virgin of Israel, and she shall be his wife. He may not put her away all his days. And of course, if she was found not to be a virgin before marriage, she was to be stoned. You can go ahead and read that on your own time. But we read that specifically, specifically, Okay, for verse 19, someone were to accuse some woman of not being a virgin under the law, and she was, he was, going, he was stuck with her. And that's the point, being stuck with. More proof, obviously, that the Lord wanted us 
to be virgins unto our marriage. More proof. Okay? And see, when you think about it, Satan is so up with the sexualizing, especially of Christianity, uh, sexualizing of everything, okay? It's like, like Carlin said, you don't get your virginity back because you were in such a hurry to get rid of it in the first place. Only nay. God intended for us to be virgins until marriage. Okay? And let's finish this up with 28 and 29. Here's the thing. Marriage is something meant to be a lifelong commitment. There are exceptions for divorce, but those are very rare and few and far between, and you need proof in order for them to happen. Okay, you can't have a gut feeling. All right, you need proof. And usually when someone is being unfaithful to you, you know. Okay? You're stuck together. Now, it doesn't have to be a, oh, we're stuck together, but you're married. In the eyes of God, that's supposed to be a lifelong thing. Okay? He hateth putting away. And we read, I forget where it is in the Pauline epistles, uh, uh, if the husband died, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Okay? Uh, for, for example, my wife's two husbands are dead and in hell. She was loosed from that bond. Okay? If one of her husbands was alive, and she divorced, and I married her, I'd been in sin. She'd been in sin. Because that would be an adulteress. Her husbands are dead. I forget where that, and I don't have that in the notes, but uh, I forget where that is. I think that's in um, Romans. If, uh, she, you know, if we're dead unto the law, if the husband be dead, she is loosed from the law of her husband. Okay, that, so it's a lifelong thing. Marriage is serious in the eyes of the Lord. He intended it for the lifespan. Okay? And mankind, especially with Christianity, has turned made the bed the deciding factor, which is why so many fail and so many people don't want to put in that extra effort as is required as a help meet. And the woman, hey, you got Joyce Meyer, you got stupid head Christy Burke, okay, you got these women preachers who are King James Bible believing Christian preacher women. Give me a break. And you wonder why I don't want anything with Christianity and especially with the Christian denomination called King James Bible believing Christianity. It's another denomination just like Episcopalian now. Or like Baptist now. It's just another denomination. Period. It's not the faith that was once delivered onto the saints. Because look at the cultic mentality that surrounds it. If a man find a damsel that is a virgin, which is not betrothed, then lay hold on her, and lie with her, and they be found. Then the man that lay with her shall give unto the damsel fifty shekels of silver, and she shall be his wife, because he hath humbled her. He may not put her away all his days. So, when you're fornicating, lying, uh, laying with someone in bed, taking an aspect of marriage outside of its context, mm. The act of copulation is not marriage in and of itself. It is an integral part of it. It's like peas and carrots. Okay? Got to be careful. Paul wanted all people to be like him. But he knew that that wasn't possible. And Paul was not against marriage. Okay, the stupid head video refuting that nonsense will be in the description box for you. You know, 
going to the city, state, whatever, not here. A ceremony, you're not going to find one as what we have today. You're not going to find it. Marriage by God is intended to be one man and one woman. Okay? You are to be one flesh, which encompasses loving your wife as your own flesh, and the wife reverencing, being submissive, subject unto her husband in everything. Okay? We're not supposed, it's not good to be a polygamist. There are grounds for divorce, but they are few and far between. And unfortunately, most of us who are married were not virgins by the time we were married. So, that is going to be it for this little video. Hopefully this will help some of you to understand what the scriptures say about marriage. Retrospect, beloved, looking back, there is no way, and even Sue is uh, like this, there is no way in Chadez that we would have gone to the state like we did and got that stupid piece of paper, which we can't find. <laughs> Go figure that one out. Okay? All right? That's not there. Is a ceremony a bad thing? No, I don't think so. I washed my wife's feet. Okay? All right, I did. It's part of our wedding thing. I washed her feet. Okay? Um, the ring thing, it's a good... Uh, I don't wear one anymore. People pretty much know I'm, you know, taken. Anyway, you know. But then again, you got to remember, that could be a draw for some, even if you're not wearing a ring. And I, I have been in a few situations where I've had to remind people, it's like, yeah, you know, my wife. Okay? All right, so the ring thing, yeah, it could be a deterrent, but you got to remember with some people... That's something that attracts. Because, hey, oh, he's only been with that one. Well, hey, he's, he's good. Or she, yeah. So, that's going to be it for this video. This, this took a while to put together. <laughs> so, um, thank you for watching. If you do, um, thank you for your prayers. Also, too, um, Monday... Your servant will have been alive for 50 years. And next week, Lord willing, um, Lord willing, I, I do hope to get to Chicago. Um, um, probably Monday uh, will be 50 years for me. Um, so I'm thinking either Tuesday, Tracting Tuesday, or probably Wednesday or Thursday. But next week, definitely sometime, uh, Lord willing, of course, going to be getting out to Chicago and spending uh, from <laughs> uh, from dawn to dusk. Going to spend the day out there. And as we are shooting for, and uh, I'm going to say this publicly for prayer's sake, brother, um, we're looking at hopefully August 19th onto the 23rd to get me down to Shelbina to spend a week with Brother Alexander. Leave and arrive on the 19th uh, here and go to Chicago, then to uh, Quincy, and then Brother Alexander be like, hey, we go to back to his place, and then leave the 23rd to catch the train from Quincy to Chicago and so forth. Please keep that in your prayer. That, that, that would be a great blessing. Uh, big month, a lot of stuff happening this month. So please keep us in your prayers. Um, please continue to pray for our dear uh, brother, um, Jeff, uh, Jeff Jones uh, from North Dakota. Have not, I, last time I talked to him, we had horrendous phone issues. And unfortunately, I haven't gotten back to him. So, so uh, please keep him in your prayers. I love you. Thank you for watching this if you do. And we'll see you in the next video. I don't know if a video will come Monday. But, uh, like I said, there's reasons for that. But um, thank you. Bye-bye.